webinar because uh, otitis B and mastoiditis are also the uh, uh, aim of interest for both. Uh, I hope that they will join us uh, very soon. We have four minutes. Uh, Tal, are you going to, to mention also some of the new pneumococcal vaccines that are in the pipeline, the 15 and the 20? Yes, yeah. just in uh, two words, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, just perfect. Because everybody here is so anxious to about this. I think that was like the hottest topic, you know, in the, in, in the vaccines world, just uh -huh. before emerge into our life. Everybody was working on the new pneumococcal vaccines, but you know, now the corona and everybody's concentrated in corona. Yeah. They switch their interest from pneumococcal to, to corona and yeah. we're there. And uh, do you also promote the influenza vaccine all the time, every year in the winter time? Yes, but I think we didn't see influenza for two years. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we haven't. We didn't have influenza in 2020, and also not in the beginning. So we are also in the northern hemisphere. Yeah. Okay. We haven't seen influenza cases for almost two years. Uh -huh. Interesting. We have now a big. A huge RSV season, okay. After you know, we didn't have to wear masks anymore. But, but in summertime, uh, uh, in summertime, in summertime, now we see you know diseases that usually we see them during the winter. You know, suddenly we see kids with otitis media. You know, when it's August here, right? Oh my, it's not external otitis. Uh, otitis. No, 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 otitis, otitis media. Otitis, otitis, media. media. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And respiratory syndrome, our hospitals here are because it's winter time, and we had uh, this week around uh, six to four uh, degrees centigrade. It is very, very, very cold in the southern part of Brazil. We are uh, fully, uh, uh, we have full cases of uh, respiratory syndrome virus all the time. Yeah, but it's winter time, it's expected, and uh, in place. So there was some. You had some snow there in Brazil. Uh, do you know that it's it's snow in some up, up in some mountains in south of Brazil in the border with Argentina and Uruguay? Yeah. yeah we had, this is and the prices of our coffee. Yeah, absolutely. Our, our coffee plantations were dest destroyed because of the cold weather. And uh, that was a problem that we had because usually. The winter time is not so harsh uh, with us as it's been this year, especially in the south and southern part of Brazil. Okay, we are ready to to start. It's um, seven uh, p.m. here in uh, São Paulo and the Brasilia time, and it's um, eleven p.m. in uh, London where we have Matthew Smith. And uh, around uh, midnight and something uh, in Israel and uh, in Tel Aviv with Tal Maron. First of all, I would like to thank you so much for in the real time that's so late in the evening that you both accepted uh, so graceful uh, to, to, to join us in this webinar in the so late hours. And we are deeply thankful to you both. Uh, I had the opportunity to hear your presentations at uh, uh, International Society of Otitis Media meeting that was uh, held uh, uh, one month uh, ago in the UK. That was fantastic, and I said uh, we should uh, share uh, your uh, presentation with a broad audience uh, in uh, many countries, especially in Latin America, but also in other parts of uh, Europe and uh, uh, Asia as well. And we had the pleasure to have here, today we're going to have uh, Tom Maron. Tom Maron is a senior uh, clinical lecturer, head of pediatric uh, otolaryngology unit, department of ENT head and neck surgery at uh, 
uh, uh, Suta Ashad uh, University Hospital and faculty at, at the Health Science at the Ben Gurion, ben -Gurion University Be'er Shiva in Israel. So um, Tal is going to present uh, first uh, his data and then we'll have uh, Matthew to share his data and then I'm going to introduce Matthew as well uh, after we end up with uh, Tal. Tal, the, the micro is yours. Uh, please uh, share your screen and it's a pleasure and thank you so much for late uh, morning time in your country to be with us. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, Tanya, can you see my screen? I think yes, you do. Yes, yes, perfect. Just perfect. Just perfect. It's one o'clock in the morning here. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm Tom Rom, and together with uh, my colleague, Matt Smith, we'll be uh, talking in the next um, 45 or 50 minutes about otitis media. First, we will um, um, review what, what has happened during our COVID-19 times. And uh, Matt will... Uh, uh, talk about the experience of mustard uh, across the United Kingdom. And then back to me, and I'll talk about the uh, otitis media during the post PCB 13 uh, vaccine. So this is me. Uh, maybe you've seen me, you, maybe you've met me before. Uh, if you come and see me in the future, come say hello. Uh, Matt will uh, shortly present uh, himself in 20 minutes from now. All right, so the, um, the, uh, the first part of the talk would be about the Titus media and the COVID-19. And actually what we wanted to do is to review how COVID-19 pandemic has changed Otitis media practices and the way we manage it. We'll, uh, we will review the literature that was published up to the end of uh, July, 2021. And as I said, uh, Matt, we'll talk about the good mustardis in the United Kingdom. First, a few words about the coronavirus. So the coronaviruses were here before. They are a group of uh, related RNA viruses. And the, the first description was back in the 1980s. In humans, coronaviruses usually cause res mild respiratory tract infections. It can range from mild to different. And mild illnesses uh, in humans include some cases of the common cold and also acute otitis media. If you go back to, um, reports from the uh, from the 80s, you'll see the old stereotypes of coronaviruses named HK goes for Hong Kong U1, NL, Netherlands 63, 229E, and OC43. Then came new uh, the new stereotypes of coronaviruses. These are the SARS-CoV back in 2002. And then we had the MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory uh, Syndrome that was um, uh, out there around 20, 2012, uh, 2013. And then, uh, of course, the major, uh, the biggest uh, coronavirus infection ever, the SARS-CoV-2, and I'll just uh, call it COVID-19, that was first reported at the end of uh, 2019. Uh, of course, SARS-CoV, uh, all of those three um, coronaviruses, the diseases were uh, caused were more uh, little. So here you can see actually a, a nice summary of all the um, knowledge that we had back from the 90s and the 2000s about the uh, involvement and detection rate of coronaviruses in the uh, hepatitis media uh, cases. As you can see, the numbers are small, okay? And what you can see here is that sometimes, even when the coronavirus was detected, it was usually associated with uh, an uncomplicated course of the disease. We can detect the coronaviruses from the ear, from the nasopharynx, and of course, uh, from the throat. If we look at the uh, 2002 and 2012, 2013 uh, pandemic, Okay, so there were no reports about oculotitis media. So now we have the new guy in the neighborhood, okay, and that's the okay, SARS-CoV-2 and oculotitis media. As we all know, that COVID-19 is usually characterized with uh, respiratory symptoms, such as cough, sneezing, uh, throat pain, and so forth. But what about oculotitis media? It took us only eight, about eight months when we first heard uh, about the uh, 
new, the first patient with COVID-19 and acute otitis media. This is a publication that came from Turkey, uh, reporting on a 35-year-old female that presented with otalgia and tinnitus, uh, with no respiratory symptoms. Physical examination was consistent with acute otitis media. And however, uh, when they tapped the ear, okay, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 was not detected. So what we can say is there was only association. So this woman had, she had been tested a positive for uh, COVID-19 from the mouth and the nose, but in the ear, it was not, uh, it, it was not detected. And there was no report on resolution or other screener of that patient. How about the presence of the COVID uh, of the virus in the autopsies? This is a report that was reported in JAMA Otolaryngology had an next surgery in October 2020, showing that two out of uh, three patients that uh, died but did not have acute otitis media before uh, their death, they showed their uh, uh, specimens from the middle ear and the mastoid actually tested positive for um, uh, a coronavirus. And what you can see here in the graph, is you see here, the, this is the, the uh, vertical axis. And what you can see here is actually the number of copies of, uh, of the virus. And as you can see, all the, this part of the graph, okay, there's a rapid increase. Uh, so what, you can see, what it means is actually that uh, the, the, the virus was actually in the mastoid and the middle ear mucosa. Next came um, a report from Iran, okay, about eight uh, adult patients. Pay attention, usually the, these are adult patients and not uh, pediatric patients with acute otitis media and other respiratory symptoms. In one patient, the PCL was positive for COVID-19 from the middle ear fluid, but it was negative from the oropharynx. So interestingly, this is very interesting. And their conclusion was that any patient with acute otitis media may be also positive for COVID-19. That's very, a very general statement. Um, what about the uh, acute otitis media burden? Well, as you can all feel, and we definitely feel this in uh, my country, uh, first we had uh, a decrease in the burden of respiratory diseases. Many, uh, the first uh, reports came from countries like Singapore, Taiwan, and Italy, and that they showed that the number of admissions, the number of uh, referrals to the emergency room, to the pediatric emergency room, declined dramatically. And what we see here is a decline, decrease of about 77% uh, percent of patients in Singapore during the lockdown period, the first lockdown period, when compared to the same periods um, uh, in the parallel uh, previous years. Other uh, reports came from Taiwan and Italy also showed a very nice decrease in, um, in the burden of acute, uh, of acute upper respiratory tract infections. What about otitis media burden? This is where the Pareto lies. What it means is that we saw a huge, huge, huge decrease in the burden of acute otitis media. And how do we know it? We know it from all those reports listed here in this table coming from Finland, the US, France, Spain, Italy, uh, and the Netherlands and other countries showing that uh, the uh, numbers of acute otitis media and the number of mastoiditis cases actually decreased. An interesting study is that was exceptional came from Spain that actually showed an increase about 45% uh, of the number of mastoiditis there. If you will read that report, you will see the uh, problem in the methodology. But many other uh, parallel uh, uh, studies showed a huge decrease in the burden of acute otitis media. And this could be explained. Patients were in the lockdown, so there was, was no uh, transmission of um, viral diseases, vertical or horizontal. Uh, we started using masks and other protective, um, um, other protective um, measures. We used uh, gels and uh, antiseptics, and of course, the social distancing. So all of these um, uh, factors, okay, of course, are uh, contributing or could be regarded as risk factors for acute practice. 
So this is the first visit. For, this is the first report from Singapore. And what you can see here is the decrease in upper respiratory tract uh, infections, including acute otitis media. So here you have very uh, nice decreases. When they compare it, for example, to UTI, to urinary tract infection, there there was no uh, substantial uh, change. This is probably one of the best studies coming from France, um, uh, engaging that data from the big Paris area, showing that the observed over the expected ratio right here in 2020, okay, was very, very low. So they expected that the number of acute otitis media would uh, react like that. But in 2020, when the corona came, it went all the way down to here. And they showed actually there was a sharp decrease of about 70% in the number of uh, acute otitis media visits compared to the expected values. This is the first um, uh, paper that came from the US showed an overall reduction in one single emergency room visits. And one you can see here, this is for acute otitis media for um, uh, children from up to the age of 15. And what you can see here, this is the years before. And what you can see here, that the number going down. This is a paper that was published in Pediatrics in April. And what you can see here, this is uh, ICD codes of admissions of about 27 uh, big hospitals across the US. And what they showed here is actually a very nice decrease in uh, all kinds of ear infections and specifically middle ear infections and mastitis. Pay attention here to the uh, decrease of about uh, 50 uh, 65% in in mustard in another big switch was the use of telemedicine what we can see here on your left uh, on your left hand side at the bottom is uh, a device that we call here in israel title you can buy it online or you can buy it from your uh, hmo supplier for about uh, 25 30 us dollars and what you can actually, you can use it at home and then you broadcast it to your health provider, which is uh, somewhere else. And what you can see here is actually, you can even show him videos and pictures of your child's ear. And this was a, a very tricky and uh, new way for us to first communicate with our patients and diagnose acute otitis media with uh, these uh, devices. Other devices were just, you know, regular video calls and telephone contacts. And uh, unfortunately, the first thing that we saw was a, an increase in the number of antibiotic prescriptions to our patients. Uh, and I would say just because or just in fear of. So we didn't want to be, uh, you know, to miss anything. If we would use a diagnosis over the phone or over the video or with uh, chats. And, but then we, we started, you know, to uh, strict ourselves, limit ourselves, and uh, started reducing the number of prescriptions. I think this is the time now for Matt. Hi, Matthew. It's a pleasure to have you here. But before, I need to let you know that we have translation to Portuguese. Temos tradução para o português. If you click in the globe, se você clica no globo, uh, as in baixo do screen, uh, below in the screen, you can uh, click and uh, just uh, click in Portuguese, and then you'll have the translation. Se você clicar no globo, em baixo do, do, da, da telinha, tem uma bolinha que é o globo, interpretation, você cai no Portuguese, aí você consegue a tradução. Well, uh, it's a pleasure for us to have uh, Matthew Smith here, that he's a senior fellow in the skull-based surgery and otology at Salford Royal Hospital in Manchester, UK. And um, also he does a lot of mastoidatis and it was a pleasure to have the opportunity to hear you at the ISOM meeting, International Society of Otitis Media meeting uh, last June in, uh, that was held in UK as well. Thank you so much, Matthew, for late hours also to accept our invitation. It's a pleasure for us to have you here. Please, the mic is yours. You can share your screen. Sure. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. So 
thank you very much for that introduction and, and it's a pleasure to talk to you all tonight uh, and to talk to such an international audience um, I'm going to talk about COVID-19 and its specific effects on acute mastitis in children and Tal's given this nice broad background as to the effects of COVID and this is on a very particular complication of acute hepatitis media uh, and within the UK and I'm presenting this on, a, on the behalf of a group of people who are put up at the end. So th this is a UK audit of paediatric mastitis and it came about because at the time of the initial peak in the UK, uh, around March 2020, there was a lot of talk about concerns of COVID causing a spike in mastitis and a spike in, in acute hepatitis media, uh, with some reports that the COVID virus had been found in the mastoid. Uh, and this is the paper that Tal alluded to, and it came out a little bit after that, but it built on this idea that we were going to have a pandemic of children with, with mastitis. And so we put together quite quickly a retrospective audit of mastitis over a 12 month period from November 2019 and a prospective period to follow on from that for six months, just to see if we could get slightly higher quality data. And this was run with Integrate and Integrate is the UK ENT trainee research network. And this is a group that I helped to put together a few years ago. And it relies really on the collaborative effort of trainees around the country. So for this study and for many others, we've had one or two trainees at each hospital around the country that's participating, and they will collect all the local data that's submitted and centralized uh, and then analyzed uh, by a small core group. And we used REDCap, which is an online data collection tool, uh, which is freely available uh, with license. So we collected data from 48 UK hospitals, uh, and there's a map there showing where they all are, and that includes Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and had 286 cases submitted, with a median of four cases per site, uh, and zero to 25 per site. And I'm gonna talk first about the population of these patients and how that differed uh, before and after COVID became a problem. And so this is the incidence of COVID uh, across those UK hospitals. Uh, and you can see, I've used two different colors here to show two different periods. And I've consistently done that throughout the talk. So throughout the talk, green is going to be the period before March, 2020, which is before we had uh, a lockdown in the UK. And things in the UK began to get quite bad in, in early March of 2020. In the middle of March, we had our schools closing, childcare closed, and we had a mandatory stay at home order for people who didn't, didn't have to go out of work and weren't essential workers. And after that period, we've had a few spikes in incidents uh, and various amounts of measures. And actually it's only in the last week or two that we've really lost any COVID measures. Uh, and so we had 179 patients who were added to the database or added to the audit prior to COVID measures becoming harsher and 107 patients afterwards. And that works out at 9.4 cases per week before uh, and two per week afterwards. Now in the UK, our winters are at the opposite side, side of the year to you in Brazil. And we have December to February are our cold winter months. And I've highlighted those here in blue. And you can see that there's a spike of incidents in December 19 to February 20, uh, and we see a seasonal spike in mastitis, just as uh, I believe you do globally. Uh, and that of course is secondary to acute hepatitis media, uh, which is secondary to the spread of uh, acute upper respiratory tract infections in children. And if you look at the period in uh, the red area, so the post COVID era, there isn't a spike in winter cases at all there. So COVID's completely flattened out that winter peak and we didn't see it. You can also see at the top there, I've put the number of cases that tested positive for COVID. So we had 113 cases that tested for, uh, were tested for COVID and only one of those tested positive. So you can see that COVID not only didn't seem to cause mastitis, there was certainly no increase or spike, but actually it suppressed it because the measures around COVID, the social distancing, the closure of schools uh, eliminated that winter uh, spike in disease. And this is the age distribution of the patients we were seeing. And uh, the green bars are the period before uh, the measures. 
Uh, and you can see that typical preschool spike in disease incidence. Uh, and our median age before March 2020 was 3.2 years, and afterwards it was 4.7, and it went up considerably. And that was largely because of a shift away from that preschool spike, and actually uh, there was much more of a flat incidence across the different age groups. Uh, and actually just, just a subtle second spike around the age of sort of 69. We looked at ethnic backgrounds, and that's primarily because uh, in the UK, but there was particular concern about COVID disproportionately affecting certain ethnic backgrounds. Uh, what we didn't find is any difference between the pre and post COVID period, and actually the incidence of mastoiditis in each ethnic group pretty strongly reflects the ethnic background of the UK. So looking next at the presenting features, and uh, most of our children presented with otalgia and pyrexia, as you might expect. But the one significant difference we saw uh, before and after COVID was the number of children presenting with chorizal symptoms, and that significantly dropped after COVID measures. And so this yet once again reinforces that picture that we eliminated that winter spike because we eliminated the number of children who were presenting with chorizal symptoms and upper through tract infections as an etiology for their mastoiditis. So for population, there was no winter peak. We saw older children and probably fewer associated with respiratory infection. Uh, and these are some of the papers. Toll's given a nice summary, so I won't speak any more about the fact that globally we've been seeing that reduction in respiratory viruses and acute hepatitis media. So what about the pathophysiology of mastoiditis now? Well, one of the most dramatic changes we saw with COVID was the mix of organisms that we were culturing. So overall, we cultured organisms in about 30% of cases. And before March 2020, this was very typical of what you might have expected to see. It was patients who had strep pneumonia, haemophilus influenza, group A strep, so strep pyogenes in their middle ear, uh, or in the mastoid or in the abscess. And it was what's been published several times before. What we saw after March 2020 was quite a significant shift in the organisms with Pseudomonas becoming by far the most dominant organism at 42%. Uh, and at the bottom, I've put some arrows on there with asterisks. That indicates the changes that are significant. Now that's the changes that are significant in the rate per week. So it's not just proportions. And what we found was that the pseudomonas actually increased in the proportion of patients, or sorry, the, the rate of patients presenting with pseudomonas after COVID hit. We also found that the patients were less systemically unwell. The white cell count was lower, the neutrophils and lymphocytes, both of them were lower. Uh, and we found that the CRP, the C-reactive protein was lower after COVID. And so these patients that were coming in after March 2020, not only did they have different demographics, but they were also a less unwell group. And that was all statistically significant. And they also had fewer complications. So prior to March 2020, we had 18.4% of patients who had complications, uh, which isn't that uncommon in, in case series, uh, and 11.2% of patients after March 2020. And if you look along the list of complications there, uh, you can see that the vast majority or, or a large proportion were intracranial uh, and sigmoid sinus thrombosis was the most common complication. And that actually pretty much halved after COVID hit. Uh, and there's lots of reasons for that, potentially in you know, the organisms, the age of the patients, et cetera. Um, overall though, none of those were statistically significant, it's worth pointing out. So for the pathophysiology, we saw different organisms we saw a milder systemic response and we saw a lower complication rate. Uh, and that all points towards a kind of COVID summer because in the summer in the UK, we tend to see these patients. Um, and you know, looking at the literature, most people don't seem to group their patients by seasonal presentation, but there was a paper by an Italian group, slightly different population, different country, but nonetheless, they found that Pseudomonas was the most commonly organi uh, isolated organism in the summer. They found that it was children aged five to nine that were most commonly affected. Uh, and they also found that they were milder inf infections and there was a limited need for surgery. So it all sounds very familiar. 
Um, now, we should consider other potential causes for this. So we know that children with pseudomonas are more likely to have middle ear disease or to have had previous antibiotics. But actually, that's not the case in the audit. We looked at the middle ear disease in the patients. There were slightly higher proportion post-COVID who had cholesteatoma or other middle ear disease, uh, but not to the point at which it explains this difference. Uh, and we also found that they hadn't had different treatment, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, it's also known that lower inflammatory markers and fewer complications are seen in older age groups. So is it simply that the age group changed and the rest kind of followed with it? Well, it's possible, but there's no real reason why the age group would have changed. And so it probably all follows on from this change in etiology with the, the lack of the winter peak. So what about the management of these patients? Well, our primary care doctors, our general practitioners in the community, didn't change particularly what they were doing. They still saw patients, whether that was remotely or in person, and they still gave them antibiotics. And there wasn't really a significant difference. The majority of the patients who were seen receiving oral antibiotics, and around half of our patients not being seen by a GP before they came to us. Looking at secondary care, well, there were some changes, uh, and this is purely looking at the antibiotic treatment we gave the patients. Um, and you can see that kermoxiclav actually increased in its use. Uh, so that's augmented. Um, and actually, the reason for that is a bit unclear because we were seeing more pseudomonas and you wouldn't normally choose to treat pseudomonas with kermoxiclav. Uh, we saw a slight decrease in, in some of the kephalosporins and, and kephaloxin in particular, um, and a slight increase in ciprofloxacin, which is still pretty uh, infrequently used in the UK. So we couldn't really work out why this change had occurred. And it was slightly worrying that we were moving away from what would be the most appropriate antibiotic in the new group. So looking next to that secondary care and imaging and transfer in particular, well, there's a similar pattern seen in both of these aspects of care. So before March, 2020, we saw around half of patients receiving a scan of some sort. Uh, the majority of them receiving a CT with or without an MRI. Uh, and after March 2020, that proportion dropped. So around 60% of patients weren't scanned at all. Uh, with patients being transferred, they were typically transferred from a smaller unit to a tertiary children's centre. Uh, and around 20% of children were transferred before March uh, and 15.9% so 16% of patients afterwards. And both of these could be because of guidance within the hospital that you should try and preserve imaging, preserve facilities for the COVID peak. You should try and reduce transfer between hospitals because of infections. But I suspect a more likely explanation for this change is simply that the patients weren't as sick, so they didn't need scanning, they didn't need to be transferred to a higher level of care. So next, looking at surgery. And there's, um, again, significant changes in what happened after COVID. So in the UK, we were, we were taking to theatre around 43% of our patients prior to COVID hitting in March 20, and 24% afterwards. So quite a considerable drop there. That was significant. Uh, and we still don't do much needle aspiration. I don't know how things are uh, elsewhere. I know certainly there are publications that advocate it but we're doing very little, around one in 20 people after COVID came along were having a needle aspiration. And of the types of surgery that were occurring, actually, it was a pretty similar mix. So a lot of patients received a ventilation tube and, and in the UK, that's typically done to general anesthetic in children. Um, and very few were actually just having incision and drainage or curatage of the mastoids. So most people who went to theatre were having a, a formal cortical mastoidectomy with a power drill. And the number of people having surgery of any type dropped during the uh, pandemic, but actually it dropped equally across all the procedures. So it wasn't that one dropped away more than the other. And so for management, we seem to have adopted a more conservative approach. We've had less imaging, less transfer, and fewer patients going to theatre. Now, one reason for the patients not going to theatre could be that our society, our British Society of Otology, suggested that patients should be managed more conservatively. And actually, 
actually stipulated that for patients with acute mastoiditis, if they were not complicated, then curatage or incision and drainage without powered drill mastoidectomy may be the first most appropriate treatment. And the reason for that, of course, as I'm sure you're aware, is that um, powered drills are quite good at generating aerosol. And there's a lot of concern over aerosol spread from COVID within the mastoid of an infected patient. And people generated tents and sort of breathing apparatus and all sorts of things to overcome that. But the guidance was still be more conservative. Um, I don't think actually that impacted many surgeons. I don't think that really changed our decision making because we didn't see more people doing curatage and incision and drainage. That dropped just as much as every other kind of surgery dropped. And then, as I mentioned, there were some inappropriate changes in antibiotic choice, and we haven't quite got to the bottom of that yet. So finally, what about the outcomes of these patients that we were seeing? Well, recurrence rates are very low, uh, and that goes for those that are treated medically or surgically. Uh, and, and that's common to the literature. It's not something that we're particularly successful at. So for patients treated medically, the recurrence rate is around 3%, and that was the same before and after the pandemic. Um, for those treated surgically, it's slightly higher uh, because they're more complex patients, normally the sicker patients, but it wasn't significantly higher after the pandemic, even though there was a slight, slight trend for that. The, the slight sort of uh, huge spike in the middle there is for needle aspiration, but I, I've put on there, this was in five patients, and we had two patients who needed needle aspiration um, treatments re repeating or something else being done. I don't think we can read too much into that given the tiny sample size. So our patients were in hospital for longer if they were treated surgically versus medically, and that was a significant difference, and you'd expect that really. Um, and there was no real difference between those treated before and after March 2020. So we weren't trying to get patients out of hospital quicker and discharging them early uh, after the pandemic hit. It's also worth mentioning that we didn't have any iatrogenic complications recorded during the uh, duration of this order in those uh, 286 patients. So finally, looking at the emergency readmission of these patients, so people coming back within 30 days, having been discharged from hospital after their initial treatment. And 4.2% of children were readmitted. Some of those for recurrence. So that was 2.1% of children were readmitted for recurrence. The rest were for complications of other, other conditions or for medical reasons or something else. And you can see that the recurrence rate, uh, sorry, that the readmission rate, I should read on the, the y-axis, was between 1% and 3% for medical patients uh, and slightly higher for surgical patients. And the trend for increase after the pandemic, I think, is difficult to put too much weight on, given the very small numbers, and it wasn't statistically significant. So we didn't really see any significant change in our outcomes following COVID-19 even though the population changed. And I think the overall take home is that our care is currently safe and it's appropriate to the patients that are coming through. There are some questions raised by this, uh, and that's, you know, we have an adaptive approach to imaging and management. I think we've, we've demonstrated that, and I don't think this is just the UK, this is common across the literature and common across the world, I suspect, that we are quite good at assessing the severity of our patients and treating appropriately. But can this be refined? Can we do something better? And should management be more conservative for a start? Well, our patients that were treated medically did very well. They didn't come back. They didn't have recurrence in most cases. We don't know, of course, if those patients that were treated surgically could have been treated equally well medically. Some of them surely couldn't because they had intracranial or other complications. And it's difficult to know for those patients in the middle whether they should be treated surgically still or whether we could be more conservative. There are papers, as, as some of you will be aware, looking at needle aspiration or um, sort of supervised home treatment. Um, but unless you actually randomize patients to these treatments, and no one's done that yet, it's very difficult to tell whether the outcomes would be poorer with more conservative management. And it's also worth bearing in mind that our iatrogenic complication rate was zero. So we're not clearly doing these patients harm by operating on them. And the next question I want to finish on is, should imaging be reduced? And again, this is a difficult one to answer. So we know that 
children potentially have some harm through having high doses of radiation at a young age. Uh, we know that if you have an MRI scan, you don't have the radiation, but you may have to have a, a general anesthetic, which carries with it some risk. Um, equally, if we're not scanning patients, we're potentially missing things. So to, to try and answer this, I, I looked at the literature and I tried to pull out some of the larger studies. And this is a not a systematic review, but it was quite a thorough look through PubMed. And picked out the studies that had quite large sample sizes and ranked them in terms of their use of scanning and then looked at the complication rates that were picked up. And you can see here there's, there's a mix of studies, many of which are single institutions, some of them are national databases, uh, pretty much all of them are over multiple years. And this is a scatter graph looking at the scan rate along the x-axis and the intracranial complication rate on the y-axis. And the larger dots are the ones that have sample sizes over 100, so potentially the more useful ones. You can see the UK audit fits in the middle, the pre and post COVID area, that era are slightly different. Um, and what you can see is a trend, and a trend for higher numbers of intracranial complications detected in patients who have higher numbers of scans. Now, there are two reasons for this, potentially. One is that some populations are sicker than others, and you tend to scan sicker patients and pick up more complications. The alternative is that if you're not scanning patients, you're not seeing the complications. And I'd just like to add a line to this, which is very much my own line rather than a statistical line. Uh, and you can argue it somewhere else, I'm sure. But it does look like there is a gradient there where for a period, until you scan up to about 40% of patients, the more you scan, the more you seem to pick up. The fact that it plateaus is suggestive, but certainly not hard evidence that if you scan above a certain rate, you may not pick any, any more, any more interclinal complications. And there's probably a sweet spot somewhere in there where you need to scan a certain number of patients to pick up all the complications. And the question of course, is how you select those patients for scanning. Uh, and I haven't summarized it because it, it gets a bit busy, but there are several papers out there that look for factors related to intracranial complications that could guide your use of scanning. And I'm afraid they don't all agree. So they all pick out slightly different things. So there isn't really consensus as to how we should use our scanning. And I think there's work to be done there. So COVID-19 has significantly altered pediatric mastitis in the UK and largely appropriate changes to management have been made. Will it last? Well, as we were alluding to earlier on, I think before the, the talk actually started, probably not. And in the UK over the last month, we've seen huge increases in the number of respiratory viruses in children, much more like a winter surge, even though we're currently in the middle of our summer. Uh, and there's been reports in the press and warnings from the government, uh, and certainly the A&Es at the moment for children are absolutely full of kids with a fever and a cold. So we're probably going to see an increase in mastoiditis again, and I suspect we'll go back to having winter peaks in the UK. So I'd just like to finish by acknowledging all those people who worked with me on this project uh, and submitted data and some of our funders. Uh, and I will now hand back to Tanya and to Tal for the rest of the talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. It was impressive, the number of hospitals that uh, you you got uh, 47 hospitals from UK. My yeah, goodness, yeah. huge statistics. Thank you so much. We are going back to you with uh, some questions that will arise for of, of for sure. Uh, right now, we're going back to uh, Tal. Tal, uh, please uh, share your screen with us. Can you see me? Yes. All right, so hello again. Uh, this part will talk to be about acute otitis media uh, in the post PCV13 era. So, if I would have given this talk about two years ago, that would be probably a very hot topic, right? But now, when the coronavirus emerged into our life, I think it just was pushed aside at this talk. 
So acute otitis media, as you know, is a very common disease. It's actually probably the most uh, common infectious diseases in children. And the pathogenesis, as you can see here, is that we have, this is the, uh, this is the kid's um, face, okay? And here you have the viruses coming from the outside, respiratory viruses. And what they uh, actually, they meet here in the nasopharynx right here is uh, three, kind, three types of uh, bacteria. Hemophilus influenza, Mark cellulitis, and the most important one, streptococcal pneumonia. When there is this viral bacterial interaction in the nasopharynx, there's an influx of this uh, mixture of uh, bacteria and viruses from the nasopharynx via the eustachian tube to the middle. So this is the accepted pathophysiology of the pitotitis media. And according to uh, data from 20, 30, and 40 years ago, strep, strep pneumonia or pneumococcus was actually the most uh, uh, important um, pathogen that was uh, related in um, to acute media pathogenesis. So what about the vaccines? If, if streptopneumonia, streptopneumonia is an important uh, bacteria, so what about vaccines? So we had the uh, vaccines. First, we had the uh, PPSV23, or Plumopax, or Prodiax. These are pneumococcal uh, polysaccharide vaccines that have been out there already in the 80s and are also given, even today, to adults with chronic diseases, people who underwent splenectomy, and immunocompromised patients and to high risk children above the year above two years of age. For example, children with sickle cell anemia, kids that actually had uh, their screens removed. Is it helpful against streptomococcal infections in children? The answer is no. It has been shown that PPSV or pneumovax is not effective in children less than two years. If there's, if there's no effect on nasal carriage of strepto, uh, streptomonia, it just has no herd immunity effect, and there's an absence of immunological memory, and the antibody levels to several serotypes of streptococcal pneumococcal decline to pre-vaccination values within three to seven years after vaccinations. Sounds maybe like our current uh, COVID-19 vaccines. But this uh, vaccine has been out there already from the 80s, and it it actually never it never uh, reached the point where it was given to infants and children. So what was what can be done? What was made is actually instead of using the polysaccharides, is actually conjugate the epitopes on the surface of the streptomonia to diphtheria protein carrier. This is the name of this new type of vaccine is the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, and I will refer to it as PCV from now on. So this is a new generation of vaccines. It was first introduced in the year 2000, which were constructed by coating removal of the capsular protein saccharides, and several types of saccharides were separately activated and conjugated to a diphtheria protein carrier. Now, there's more than 1995 serotypes of strep pneumonia. So should we take all of them? It's practically impossible. And the first vaccine was PCV7 that was introduced in the, in the US. And here you have the seven serotypes that were contained in the original vaccines. This is the last field classification of um, strep pneumonia. And you see they picked the most common seven serotypes at that time that were responsible for invasive pneumococcal disease, uh, bacteremia, meningitis, not related to acute hepatitis media. It took some years uh, for uh, countries first uh, to buy it, then to show, uh, and then to implement it in their own uh, national immunization uh, programs. Uh, for example, in Israel, it was licensed on, only in 2006, and the reason is that we are a small market, and it was included in the national in our national immunization program only in 2000, so almost nine years after it was launched in the U.S. And then came PCV13 that was licensed in 2010, and actually it contained six more serotypes, 
So we had the first, the original seven that uh, was uh, were using the PCV7, and they added six more. And why is that? Because of the phenomenon that was uh, termed serotype shift. After using PCV7, so the, the, the serotypes contained in the uh, original vaccine were not abundant anymore, and they had new uh, serotypes coming in. So now uh, they are now included in the PCV13. Uh, after the PCV13 was launched and was uh, licensed in 2010, uh, many countries, including uh, my own country, actually changed uh, PCV7 after non-inferiority studies. What I mean is, it was not shown that PCV13 was superior to PCV7, it was just non-inferior. It made sense to start using PCV13 because it allowed, it offered a broader coverage of serotypes. In many countries, and including in South America, you guys have probably feed CV10, and that was introduced in 2005 in Europe. And the difference is this are, it has only 10 pneumococcus serotypes included. And here you have the numbers, and they are also conjugated to a protein D, but um, not, it was also a protein carrier, not from bacteria, but from non typable lemophilus influenza to avoid interference with concomitant vaccinations. And uh, of course, it makes sense to uh, 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 vaccinate together against two uh, bacteria that are responsible for acute attacks media, non typable hemophilus influenza, and strep pneumon. It is now licensed in more than 130 countries outside the US. And it is used in more than five, uh, 45 countries in, nat in their uh, national immunization programs, mostly in Europe and South America. And the name uh, that you probably know it is Sylphorix. So what is the effect of PCBs on atidotitis media? These are, this is a huge meta-analysis that showed, for a big surprise, that the RRR, the relative risk reduction, uh, after starting using PCV7 and PCV10, was very, very mild. As you can see, the first studies using PCV7 actually showed that if you use PCV7, the incidence of acute otitis media is just increasing. It doesn't make sense. But then later studies show that uh, there was a reduction of about 6%. It's a very modest decrease. How about PCA feed and CV10? The uh, relative risk reduction was a bit more overt and it ranged from 6 to 15%. What about PCV13? Very surprisingly, not many studies have been uh, published. So, uh, in the next few slides, I will talk about the, uh, uh, the experience that we have so far. We are almost now more than 10 years after PCV13 or FITCV that came out. And what is the experience accumulated with these vaccines on acute otitis media burden in children? Let's start with Brazil. So this is an economical study showing that after um, uh, implementing FITCV, okay, in the Brazilian uh, uh, pediatric uh, national immunization program, there was a reduction of almost 40%. This is the vaccine efficacy of the FITCV. This is before and after FITCV uh, introduction. So there was a 40% uh, decrease in the number of acute otitis media. Now, it is less than invasive pneumococcal disease, but as you can see, the numbers here of acute otitis media, which is of course more prevalent than a community acquired pneumonia, the second year, and invasive pneumococcal disease. So you give you you you, you introduce a new um, intervention in the population, aiming to reduce invasive pneumococcal diseases and severe pneumococcal infections. But you also get, and this is what it shows here, the nice pyramid here, that the biggest reduction was in your daily life routine acute otitis media cases. So this is the Brazilian experience. This is a Mexican study uh, this is showing that uh, it's more like an analysis or economical study. So in Mexico, PCV7 it was introduced in 2006 and it was switched to PCV14 in, in 2010, but also FITCV10 is available in the private market. So this is an hypothetical study trying to estimate what would be, is it worthy to switch from PCV13 to PCV10? 
And the answer probably for acute otitis media, same number. Okay. So for acute otitis media, if you switch from PCV13 to PCV10, it's probably uh, much of the same. This is a very problematic Danish study showing uh, that actually the incidence of acute otitis media, as expected, decreased by 60% 60% after the introduction of PCV7. But, and here's the big but, it increased to almost three vaccine levels in the PCD15 era. So this is a bit problematic. You see the number of patients here, it's only 250 patients. And um, they were not show, they were they could not show any uh, reduction in the acute otitis media uh, incidence. I have to tell you that this study has been criticized for the uh, very problematic methodology. Sweden. Sweden is actually our real life uh, laboratory. And why is that? In Sweden, some counties vaccinate with PCV7, the PCV10, and some counties like Stockholm, the biggest uh, city in uh, Sweden, vaccinate with PCV13. So what we can see here, this is the price to treat AOM episode. This is the county of Skane, where we use PCV or PCV10. And this is the second county that um, started using PCV13. This is about five to six years after um, um, the, each, each county actually uh, uses the, those vaccines. And what you can see here is actually the same. So the price to call to, to um, the price to um, uh, pay for one AOM episode in this count, uh, county is almost equal to the, the price to uh, for one AOM episode in that county, showing that uh, PCV10 and PCV13. And you, when you see, when you look at the, uh, at the article and you see the other graphs, it's actually that the effect for acute otitis media just in Sweden uh, is equal for both vaccines. Going now to the USA, and now we have not 250 kids, we have about 11.5 uh, million children. And what you can see here is actually this is the trend of acute of uh, uh, the incidence rate, and what you can see here is. This is from the uh, right after PCV13 actually was launched, as I remember, 2010. And you see here a small reduction, okay? The biggest reduction was, of course, in the little ones from zero to two years, and the very mild reduction in those three to nine years. If I would uh, calculate, it's about 15 to 20% maximum of additional 15 to 20% uh, decrease in the uh, burden of acute otitis media during the post pcv 14 years. This is why we looked at our own data. So we were able to follow about one to 1.1 million children here in the uh, central and Jerusalem districts of the, the largest uh, HMO here in Israel. And this is the number of population, as you can see, as, as expected, the number of children increases during the year. But this is the time, this is the, uh, the uh, incident, the, the number of AOM episodes. And as you can see, this is, these are the years of the introduction of PCVs right here, 2010, 2011. After an initial increase, it just plateaued. You see the graph of the population is going up, and this one is plateaued. We actually were able to capture more than 800,000 um, uh, AOM episodes contributed by more than 270,000 uh, 270, children uh, over 14 years. So we had three years before the PCV and 10 years uh, before the PCVs. Uh, in Israel, because we had uh, just a short, a very narrow interval between PCV7 and PCV14, we just, I had to divide the, the, those children from before and after the PCVs. And what you can see here is actually a big reduction that haven't been reported so far in the post-PCV 13. 
when we look at the, when we stratify the uh, number of episodes uh, per 1,000 children, according to, to, the year, to, um, to the age, you'll see the biggest reduction was in the target population of the vaccine. From two to two, from zero to two years, and as you can see, this was a reduction of about twenty-one percent in uh, zero to one-year-old, and this is a reduction of almost ten percent in one to two years old. As the children get, grow older, okay, the uh, effect is, um, is less prominent. So from zero to one, and from two to from one to two years, this is the, the biggest reduction. And we saw it both in uh, boys and girls and for all ethnic groups. And uh, we actually feel it now that in, in our daily life in clinics, we see less uh, pediatric patients with uh, AOA. That was true until the corona came. And what you can see is, this is actually the most important graph in this presentation. So for single acutotitis media episode, it doesn't really matter. But for recurrent cases, those are the cases you see them again and again and again. You give them antibiotics and then you send them to tubes. Here you see that for kids who were born after the PDA vaccine, compared to those who, who were born before the vaccines were available, you see a big difference. Okay, so. If you were born after the vaccines came out and were available, your chance to be without, without, pay attention, without, without acutotitis media is higher. New vaccines are on the horizon, PCD15 and PCD20. The bottom line is that they were almost there in the market, okay? But now when the corona came, um, probably they were just pushed aside. Then the next probably a promising vaccine would be PCV20, which will contain PCV13 and seven more additional therapies. The problem is that they expect to see a, an unproportional increase in the use in the non typable hemophilus influenza cases if they start using the, uh, the uh, PCV20. I will stop right here. And I will conclude that it was in the, during the post-PCV 13 years, okay, the uh, decrease was much more overt when compared to uh, PCV 7 and PCV 10. That's all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Tal. It was a very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, thank you for being with us. It's uh, 2, 2, 2 a.m. In, in, in Israel right now. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So much and uh, 1 a.m. in uh, or midnight in in, uh, in UK. So uh, we had uh, first. Uh, I had a, a question or maybe uh, maybe a comment from Silvana Coelho uh, from um, Fortaleza in Brazil. She said that in her opinion, acute uh, otitis media case decreased due to school uh, absenteeism. So the kids didn't go to school. And that was the main reason for uh, the kids not uh, acquiring otitis media. So not going to school, not having uh, upper respiratory uh, microorganisms. This is her uh, opinion. And uh, I don't know in your country if the kids uh, were out of the school during the whole year, like it was here in Brazil, the kids- we had we had waves, okay? So we had the first lockdown, the second lockdown, the third lockdown, and maybe in September, even the fourth lockdown, okay? So whenever, you know, a lockdown was declared, schools and kindergartens, okay, were the first one to, to, to be closed. And mm -hmm. yes, okay, it's social distancing. And of course, kids didn't see each other, okay? And uh, there was no horizontal transmission, okay, from one child to another one. Yeah. And uh, we have also uh, from mastoiditis cases, Matthew. Um, it, it was impressive, like uh, before uh, pre-pandemic uh, uh, era, you had nine cases per week. And then in the pandemic uh, uh, times, two cases per week. So from nine, it shifted to, to two cases. And also even in, in the winter time. And the median age also increased. Uh, from lower age to uh, higher age, uh, from um, 
uh, shift age from 3.2 to 4.7 age uh, 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 after the pandemic uh, times. And what was striking is the pseudomona cases. Uh, I had the opportunity to read this um, Italian from Umbria cases, uh, this uh, report that they also had the pseudomonas uh, aerogenosa cases in mastoiditis. So the same as you, do you want to comment about the, how, how pseudomonas uh, case rise? So do you think that is, is scan uh, also problem that uh, related? So I think some of the, the dramatic change is from removing all the cases that you would normally see from the upper respiratory tract infections and the acute tinnitus media. Um, but actually that doesn't explain it all because there was still, there was actually an increase in the number of patients with pseudomonas. And, you know, we also looked at antibiotic use, as I said, and, and patients with middle ear disease, uh, and that hadn't really changed. So I don't think I do have a good answer as to why it went up quite to the extent that it did. Um, but there's a lot of things that seem to be linked in terms of the pseudomonas, the age, the comorbidities, the, um, uh, the, the severity of the disease um, and it does fit with the picture from the Italian group uh, now I you know there are papers where pseudomonas is quite a prominent organism and there was a study from the UK uh, just in a single institution a year or so before ours where pseudomonas wasn't the most common but it was something like third I believe or maybe second most common so you know it, it's it's not it's not unheard of to have a lot of pseudomonas, but to certainly to have it so dominant and such a significant change is unusual. But I think it's probably just that we don't look at the seasonal variation very much. There's no particular need to normally look at that. And that's what's, you know, as one of your, your re, uh, listeners commented on, it's, it's people not mixing at school and, and all these things that prevent respiratory viruses spreading. Mm. And could you comment also on scan? Uh, the, the, the need to scan uh, more often those kids. That's a thing that's so very important. We have a single intracranial complication from a patient with pseudomonas. Um, now, you know, that it's, it's, a, it's a moderate sized sample, but I don't think we can base the fact on if they've got pseudomonas, you can't, you don't scan them because, you know, sometimes pseudomonas is, a, is colonizing the ear canal and, and sometimes it's a, a contaminant. But um, you know, it'd be nice to have something with scanning. The one thing we did have with scanning is that any patient, that headache was quite strongly predictive of an intracranial complication. Mm -hmm. Isn't groundbreaking, but nonetheless, it's quite interesting that that did come out. But certainly, other groups. And it's true because it was in older group, also more prevalent the mastoiditis. Yeah. 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 That was interesting. I think that's again because you've lost that preschool group. Who traditionally get mm -hmm. respiratory viruses and get mastoiditis. So mm -hmm. You've taken them away. I think that's why the age shifted higher. But but there was that slightly strange hump that we hadn't seen before in the sort of five to nine ish. And uh, <clears throat> I was impressed about the uh, surgical approach that you get uh, about the cortical mastoidectomy and power uh, drill that yeah. you had uh, in most of the cases. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how you manage it, um, you know, in South American countries. In the UK, normally if they go to theatre, they get a, a cortical mastoidectomy with a, with a drill. Yeah. No, for us, usually it's first to needle aspiration and put the, uh, the ear tubes, and then mm -hmm. later on, if it continues to, 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 to drill. But usually uh, first uh, we do the needle aspiration and the, and the ear tubes that it was a more conservative approach, especially in this pandemic time. I think that uh, we had some cases that we did this and not uh, they didn't go to the specific uh, mastoidectomy uh, surgery. The needle has never caught on in the UK. And mm -hmm. um, it's just not something that we do. So we don't have experience of it. And I noticed that some of the needles that were done were done under general anesthetic. So I think mm -hmm. that's for you I think most people would use a local so perhaps we have things to learn <laughs> yeah no 
Okay, thank you. And uh, I would like also to switch to Tau about um, uh, the, the 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 vaccines. We we are uh, having a higher cases here of nineteen uh, A uh, serotype pneumococcal serotype in uh, invasive disease because we don't uh, do the ear tap here. But uh, as you, you mentioned, we use the uh, TENS uh, valent vac pneumococcal vaccine here. It's universally given, free of cost. But uh, we are having uh, more and more, over and over, 19A uh, uh, pneumococcal serotype here uh, rising. So maybe we are going to switch to um, uh, pneumococcal uh, 13 uh, valent vaccine. But I was surprised that in Sweden, uh, they had uh, no, not too much uh, influence on the certain serotypes. It's like if they didn't switch from apples to bananas. They switch uh, using the tens and the certain to banana uh, kind of gala and banana fuji. So um, uh, apple gala and apple fuji. So the same kind of uh, apple. It was not a, a sharp or a striking uh, Switch, uh, switching from the tens to the 13 in Sweden, in Stockholm mainly. You want to comment on that? So the big pharmaceutical companies look at Sweden as the biggest playground in Europe. Mm -hmm. Some counties, they vaccinate with this vaccine and some counties vaccinate with that yeah. vaccine. It doesn't really happen in other countries, okay? In other countries, it's a national immunization program. So once you're decided to vaccinate, with you to go with van vaccine, that's it. It's for the whole population. There's no dependence, okay? So what they do now in Sweden is actually they analyze, okay, what is the vaccine efficacy in many parameters, okay? So PCV13 and, and the uh, feed CV, the PCV10, not only on otitis, but also on antibiotic resistance of bacteria, okay, mastoiditis cases, I think that the bottom line is probably that PCV13 is superior, okay, to PCV10, okay? Even though it's prom it's, it seems to be promising, okay, that the, um, uh, and it makes more sense, right, to combine in one vaccine, both influenza oh, yeah. and probably uh, the, the 19A that is not covered by the PCV10, but it is covered by the PCV13, it will does make the difference, it what makes the difference. So we hope so that we are going to switch from bananas to apple, not staying the same apple uh, kind of. Uh, um, Matthew, we have uh, another question here from uh, Dr. Lubianka from Porto Alegre. That uh, why, in, in your opinion, does the pseudomonas etiology increase so much? Less acute otitis media case causing mastoiditis or more uh, chronic otitis media ca causing this? I already asked you, but uh, you could answer straight. Uh... I think we eliminated, you know, the organisms that we saw decreasing. So all, all the children, which, which remember make up the bulk of the population prior to, to COVID, all the children who are in the age of, you know, one to two years old who had Haemophilus and, and, and the other typical bacteria. Um, and we saw a higher proportion of children with, with Cholesteatoma, as I mentioned, and, and chronic otitis media. It, it doesn't explain though why the rate per week went up, um, but you know, I, I don't know whether we were having children who had developed mastitis anyway because they had some chronic ear disease, but they they happened to get Haemophilus or something because of their, their respiratory tract infection, and, and they you know, just didn't get that. I don't think we really know. It's a bit odd the way that it's increased quite so much. I think the fact that it was unmasked is not surprising when you lost all the common causes of mastoiditis, but the increase is a bit odd. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I looked uh, 